Steve Smith at Walnut Creek. Roger has more than 30 years of experience practicing real estate and business law. Uh, so as such, I think that Roger is well versed in some of the considerations, the practical considerations uh, that will be discussed tonight. Roger has uh, been a consultant and also a contributing uh, editor for many CEB publications and has also authored a number of articles uh, related to his practice. Our other speaker tonight is Dick Frankel of Frankel Goldberg Ferber in San Ramon. Uh, Dick is up counsel, which I presume refers to playing golf and lying on a beach. <laughs> and uh, like Roger, Dick also has uh, 30 years of experience practicing uh, in business and employment law. Uh, Dick taught at JFK for 25 years and uh, was a member of the Board of Governors and also the Committee for State Bar Examiners for the State Bar of California. Committee of Bar Examiners. Committee of Bar Examiners. And I believe that uh, Dick is well versed in some of the ethical considerations that will be discussed tonight. So without further ado. I'm going to start with this. And uh, we're going to start with uh, just going through a few things that are interesting quickly. So let's talk about the lawyer population. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says there's about 800,000 lawyers out there. And uh, when we talk about that, uh, in California, there's about 184,000 active practitioners. So we've got about 23% of, of, of the active group in, in the United States. Uh, and, and what's of interest is uh, 350,000 are practicing firms of 2 to 100. Uh, and, and that represents about 44% of all the practicing attorneys. And, and, and uh, what that means is, in, in today's day and age, there's a lot of movement in terms of lawyers going from one firm to another. The, the model that existed at one point with the pyramid structure of big law uh, isn't the same as it's been. So for people that are changing law firms, both associates and partners, uh, it's real. It, it actually happens. Uh, the next few slides are just informational in terms of who's involved in lateral, lateral hiring and what are law firms looking for. So that's just informational only. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, State Bar of California, the statistics are we've got about 250,000 lawyers, and I don't think this includes the results of the February bar exams. So we got another couple added to that. Uh, in Contra Costa County, we probably have about 3,800 lawyers, and, and uh, probably just over half of those are engaged in practice uh, either inside the county or, or somewhat outside the county. And, and if you look at the inactive, you're going, holy smokes, uh, that's a lot of inactive. And then if you look at not eligible to practice law, a little under 5%, you go, what's all that about? That's a lot of people. That's just under 12,000. Not eligible to practice? Who do you think those are? They're what, Perhaps not paying their dues? They're perhaps not paying their dues, yeah. So those are people that don't come to ethical courses like this. They get involved in, in the state bar. And you know what people say, because I've been involved in the State Bar for a long, long time, and one of the things people uh, tell me all the time in the State Bar, once you pass the bar and you're admitted, you never ever want to hear from them again. Mm -hmm. Because the letter you get oftentimes is from the uh, Office of Chief Trial Counsel, where there's doing some type of investigation. And, 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 and so if you don't go to ethical courses and keep up on all this stuff, uh, and if you're uh, trying to then leave your firm and, and do unethical things, that's when the state bar can get a hold of you. So we're not going to try to avoid that. Interview questions, this is just FYI. So perhaps those are of interest to you, perhaps they're not. So now let's go to what happens if we want to change law firms. So Roger, I'm ready to leave. I, I, I've had enough. And I'm saying uh, I can't contact my clients before I, I give notice. What about that? Well, let me start out by saying I, I've, I've been there, done that. So, uh, and I've had it go good and I've had it go not so good. Uh, I can't get into the particulars, but I'll just, let's tell you that the best way to handle this is to go to whoever it is that you have to communicate with, managing partner, co-partner, whoever it is, and just say, here's the deal, I'm leaving. I'm leaving and that's gonna happen and I'm here to talk to you about how do we do this in a manner that's gonna be the least disruptive and mutually beneficial to the firm and myself and the clients as going and going forward. Uh, you could get one of two things can happen. You'll either get the okay, let's work this out, let's come up with a with a, a 
game plan, let's set a time frame, and here's what we're going to do. Or you'll get the thanks for showing up, there's the door, we'll see you pack up your stuff, you're out of here. And you have to be prepared for both contingencies. Uh, if you are a partner in a firm, uh, you may have a notice requirement. It says you are obligated to give your firm a minimum amount of notice. Some of those documents will say that the law firm has to reciprocate by giving you that much time to stay. Others said it's within the discretion of the firm to say you've got to get out. Um, so again, they could hand you, they could basically show you, I should say, the door and say you're out of here. But no, you, you, you cannot communicate with your clients uh, and tell them that you're leaving before you have advised the firm because technically, depending on the nature of the partnership, the way it's structured, those are clients of the firm. Yeah, but Roger, Inga's been a client of mine for all these years. I've known her for 10 years, and I want to make sure that I've got somebody to come with me. So I'm say, Inga, I'm thinking about leaving, and, and I can't even say, Inga, will you come with me? No, not under the, not under the rules of professional responsibility. Now, the flip side of that is you've known Inga for 10 years. She's been your client. She's going to likely go, when she doesn't know anybody else at the firm, you handle a unique aspect of law in which she's interested in has have, has issues, and therefore the likelihood of her doing anything but go with you is pretty slim. But what I hear you saying is, is I better be careful. Better be careful. Okay. So what about client in inquiries? What happens if Inga, uh, on her own, wants to approach another lawyer? and say, you know what, I'm really not happy with Dick. Roger, I want to talk to you. Uh, any problem with that? None, none whatsoever. Uh, I think there's a quote somewhere in here that uh, clients are not chattel, not, not equipment or something along those lines. The clients always have the ultimate say in where they, they choose to, to uh, position their work. Okay, so now I'm thinking about leaving and I'm going, well, you know, there's some files that, that I'd really like to have. And I've been working with Inga a long time so uh, how about some client papers? Can I, can I take any of those? No, those are definitely belong to the firm. In fact, the firm in its malpractice uh, underwriting, et cetera, has to make representations about the fact that they own the files and what controls they put on the files often and that sort of thing. So you can't take the client files. The client files belong to the clients. Uh, you'll see what we'll talk about a little bit later. There are documents of the documents that you have in a system or a form file of some sort of you're still old school like some of us and you have hard copies of some of that stuff and you prepared it, you can take those with you but you cannot take the client files themselves without the authorization of the firm and the client for that matter. Oh, let's talk about the forms. You mean I can take the forms? So I've worked on a lot of transactional documents with Inga but I can't take her files but I can take the forms that I prepared. That you prepared, yes. That I prepared. You prepared. For Inga. For Inga. Ooh, but, because those are copies of what's in her file. I see. So that's an interesting issue. I've actually litigated that issue, uh, where in a law firm, uh, somebody left, and uh, the partner said, hey, wait a minute, the departing associate just ripped off all of these documents that they consider to be forms. Uh, and I actually got a TRO. So I think that's an unsettled issue. Now, I will say there is a formal opinion in here. We'll, we'll get to it in a minute. Or maybe it was an a ABA model that said forms uh, that were created by the lawyer are okay to take. I, I'm not so sure about that. And when we get to some of the citations in a minute with respect to the formal opinions and the model rules, I'm going to address some of those issues. So I think that's an open question in my mind. Reasonable people can disagree. Uh, but I'm, I would be concerned as an associate for taking virtually anything that wasn't in the public domain. Uh, without permission. I like to get permission. I just think that's a really good... I would agree. I think you should get permission. But the other thing that I would say is that in a lot of... Nowadays, firms have gotten more sophisticated, as have all employers, and there are employee handbooks, etc., that deal with a lot of these issues and basically say anything that you create on behalf of the firm while you are here belongs to the firm, which obviously it creates another layer of complexity. Actually, that's a good point. So if I'm representing the firm and I'm drafting an employment agreement, that's going to be part of my employment agreement, which says, by the way, these documents belong to the firm. They may not be taken by you. And many times I've seen, and I'm always curious about this too, employee handbooks that have a copyright notice. Copyright notice, really? They original, they're original documents they created? 
I'm always intrigued about that as well. But I think it's a it's a very uh, it's a nebulous issue, and I, I just would touch it carefully. Okay, so when changing law firms, uh, and this is just sort of some interesting stuff, have a written offer, uh, resign from the, the, the current firm with a date certain. Uh, this is an interesting one uh, about insurance. So how many people in Cal how many attorneys <coughs> in California do you think have legal malpractice coverage? What do you think? What's the percentage? 60. What do you think? 60. 60. Good luck, Glenn. Yeah. I wish it were. The state bar would love to have 60%. It's That's actually... Right. Uh, no, actually, 60% have it. You know what? You're right on the money. 40% don't. Good, Glenn. Sorry. <laughs> well, about 40% don't have it. I think that's, a, that's an, an exceptionally high number uh, that do not have legal malpractice coverage. But actually, I was not aware of a Rule 3-410, which provides that if we do any legal work where we're going to be spending more than four hours with the client and we don't have uh, uh, malpractice coverage, that's got to be disclosed in a fee agreement. Uh, I wasn't aware that this is fairly recent. This is only about four years old now. And, and I did not know that. So the issue is, if you're leaving, is what about coverage? And what about tail coverage? If, if you're going to be going to either to your own firm or another firm, how are you going to handle the insurance matters and what the disclosure issues are? Does everybody here know what tail coverage is? So tail coverage means that you have, back up for a second, this is insurance 101 here for a brief second, that if malpractice insurance, E&O insurance, is what they call claims made insurance. It's not, it's not occurrence based. So for example, your automobile insurance is occurrence based, which means that the policy that you have in place at the time that you get into that car accident is the, is the policy that would cover you in the event that you get sued for any of that or have any claims arising out of that. Claims made policy, on the other hand, is the policy that's in place at the time that the claim is made. And so those policies have dates certain and they end as of a certain date. They also end when you are no longer a member of the firm. Now some of those do extend. Some of those will say, we cover all attorneys for a certain period of time, even if they leave the firm, but not all those policies <coughs> say that, so you need to be familiar with that. But what tail coverage does is tail coverage will extend that same coverage to you that you had in the old firm for a certain period of time until you can get coverage at the new firm. Tail coverage, but you need to get, that's very specific, that varies from carrier to carrier, and it can be very expensive depending on the nature of the coverage. Yeah, that's a really important point. So uh, I, I do think we should keep that in mind. So now, People have said, okay, you want to leave, so you talk to your managing partner, Roger, and you say, okay, I'm going to leave. What are we going to think about next? How do we, how do we want to do this? Well, I, I think, again, the idea is, number one, I think you talk about, well, how do we plan? What's the time? How are we going to, how are we going to do this? Are we going to do this in an orderly fashion? Is it 30 days? Is it 60 days? Is it 45 days? Whatever it is that says, okay, I'm going to, within that time frame, when this day comes, I'm no longer at this firm, and I'm either on my own or I'm with another firm. Then we say, okay, what are we going to do about clients? Clients that are some clients that are of the firm. There's some clients that are mine. And by mine, I mean they don't know anybody else but me here at the firm. Maybe they know another associate. We'll get to. Uh, and what do we do with the files? What do we do with the, the documents? What do we do with the documents in the file that have been created either for this client or by myself? What do we do with all that stuff? What can we take? What can we not take? And I think you go down item by item and you, you hit the, those things. And you go back to that list if you forget something. And the other is notice. What kind of notice do we send out? <clears throat> do I send out the notice? Do you send out the notice? Do we jointly prepare a notice and we both sign it? Do I prepare a draft and give it to you to review? Do you prepare a draft and give it to me to review? Because again, all in all, we want to make sure this is an orderly process. Now all that comes to a grinding halt, obviously, if it's the there's the door, see you later. But to the extent that you can set that up ahead of time, you're <clears throat> miles ahead of the game. And so paramount to me is the ethical consideration, which is the client's interests have to be protected. So the clients have to be notified. The last thing we want to do is abandon clients. Uh, so and I think that dialogue with the managing partner, whoever you're working with, is, is really important. Um, and then I like uh, proposing some type of a positive marketing joint letter so that everybody's a winner here, keeping in mind the client's best interest. Um, and and uh, 
just like Roger, I've been through this drill before as well. And, and when I did it, uh, first time, uh, it is, uh, we, we had a letter go out to the client. We said, if you're going to stay here, the person that's going to do your work is X. Uh, if you don't want to and you want to come with me, then we ask you to sign a letter uh, and, and giving the authorization to continue representing. All, all approved ahead of time, all approved by everybody so that there was no ambiguity. Yeah. Just to expand on that, we actually, when I left one place, we actually came up with a form letter with a kind of a check the box. I want this firm, to, I want to go with, 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 with Roger, I want to stay with the firm, I want the files to go, I want the files to stay. You just check the box, you sign it, you send it back in, it's a piece of cake. They can scan it, email it, fax it, mail it to us, however they want it to handle it. I believe you Yeah, so that, that, that's a good, good approach. Uh, and the, the, any retainers, we want to make sure and, and uh, th those are covered. Uh, we have trust fund obligations through I or IOLTA accounts, and we don't want to get in hot water with the state bar on that one as well. I, I will tell you one issue with regard, not necessarily the retainers, because retainers kind of solves the problem, but it's delinquent clients. What do you do with clients who owe their existing firm money? You go and start billing them, and they start paying you, but they're not paying the old firm for the old work that you do. It's an interesting issue that, that needs to be Yeah, actually, that, that's a good one. Let's talk about that. So my view is this. I think that's an issue that would be discussed before you leave. And what I'd like to do is say to the old firm, you get paid first. You get paid first. I, I don't want any issues here. Uh, or if the client's coming with me, I say to the client, listen, can you pay off the old firm first? I'd really appreciate that. Uh, and, and try to have something work out so that that's not going to be an issue. Uh, I, I actually haven't made it a part of this presentation, which is the unfinished business doctrine. <coughs> I don't know if you follow that. There's some actually recent appellate decisions on this. This is the boxer case that everybody has in your business associations class in law school. And this is the Stuart Boxer, the firm in, in uh, Oakland, his wife, Barbara Boxer. And this is the, the, the case that goes back, my gosh, long time. Long time. I don't know. I forget what year it was, but a long time. No, Glad not that. If you had it long in law school, it's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's the unfinished business doctrine in terms of what happens to those those fees that haven't been paid. Well, we'll, we'll do an, another ethical course another day. For that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when when your uh, when notification, this is just a checklist of who to notify. It's not just a simple matter of saying audios. I'm going to go across the street and open up my own law firm. There's a lot of folks that have to be notified, and, and you can see the checklist on the screen. One I would put on there that, that's just not on there, but one that's important is your lender. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, I like to make sure there's no lenders in my practice because I don't want to owe anybody anybody. anything. So, if by chance you have a line of credit or anything like that, uh, especially if you're a partner leaving uh, and you own a percentage of the firm and there's a buyout involved of any type, you will have, one could probably talk about this better than we can, and that is you have what they call change of ownership provisions in your documents in your covenants that say in the event that the ownership percentage in the firm changes by X percent, that that's a technical default if it doesn't happen without the lender's consent. So those are just little things that come up. Well, actually, there's more than that, because now we're getting well, more. Right, there's a lot more than that, because <coughs> oftentimes, although associates, hopefully associates wouldn't be doing this, but partners would, would, would be citing as guarantors right. with, with vendors and suppliers. So hopefully associates aren't going to go there, but if you are, that's a huge issue to make sure you're off any credit applications where you're a personal guarantor. So thank you, Roger, for that. That's a good point. Uh, okay, so now we've said we're out of here. And David's an associate, uh, firms in trouble, profits are shrinking, lawyers are leaving, morale's low. We don't know any firms like this. This is purely a hypothetical. <laughs> There's never been a firm in that situation. So David says he wants to move to another firm. He wants to make sure he brings as many clients with him as possible wherever he goes. That's natural. He says, hey, if I'm going to leave, yeah, that's what I want to do. Uh, David wants to reach out and start letting clients know, start planting the seed. Hey, I want to go to a new firm. Uh, he also wants to talk to an associate or two about joining him. So what actions can David ethically take with respect to notifying current <coughs> clients the possibility he's going to leave? Roger, we talked about this before, but is there anything at all I can do prior to notifying the firm that I'm working with? Anything at all? Well, again, there is a, a rule that says the clients are supposed to be notified if the lawyer leaving the firm is, is if the lawyer handling their their matter, excuse me, is leaving the firm. Let them know where you're going. But 
Short of that, I don't believe that there's any way to notify these clients in the absence of somebody saying, there's the door, see you later. Yeah, so I, I agree with Roger on this, but I must tell you in my experience, uh, it's the exception rather than the rule that actually happens. I would agree. I mean, I don't, I'm sure Glenn's been around long enough, and then Dick and I have been around long enough to tell you that we've all heard of the firms with the midnight moves, where you know the, the, the guys show up, don't say anything, pack up the files, pack up the everything that they got about the clients, get everything, and out the door they go in the middle of the night, and uh, the next morning they're over <coughs> operating a new firm with all these clients that they surreptitiously contacted and obtained. Uh, some sort of consent with regard to the file, substitutions of attorney, etc. Some of those end up in litigation, but a lot of those just uh, end up in some sort of negotiated resolution. Yeah, so let's talk about that. What are the consequences of getting it wrong? You say end up in litigation. What, what happens if I guess wrong? Yeah, you can be sued, obviously. Not only can you be sued by your partner, but that's an ethical violation of the bar. Yeah, you know? that, and like you said, that's the last person you want to hear from. Yeah, it really is. It, it really is. So people would say, well, really, is the state bar going to really come down on you on that? You know, it's no different than going down the freeway at 80 or 90 miles an hour. How many people are caught percentage-wise? Probably not that many, but if it's your bad luck and you get stopped and pulled over for doing 90, then it's a bad hair day for you. So my view of it is that we ought to be sensitive to that. And, and a part of our responsibilities are to adhere to the rules of professional conduct and, and to the business and professions code. So I, I, my advice would be to honor that. So now David says, well, uh, what about notifying another associate? I, I can't talk to another associate? What about that? Technically, it's a solicitation. I mean, arguably, that you're, and again, there, there, there's nothing that says you can't do it necessarily, but if you are asking someone to leave, and they are subject to an employment agreement, they are some, some sort of an agreement with the, with the firm, I mean, you are technically interfering with a contractual relationship. Uh, you also could be interfering with the prospective economic advantage. If that associate is the key person who's dealing with a particular client, you don't necessarily deal with him. The other partners might not necessarily deal with him or her or it, but that associate's key. And if you're now talking to that associate about leaving the firm and taking that client with him, I've seen and I've been on the other end of claims where I've defended claims or someone is alleged, that's an interference. So the business tort concept is there, so how are we supposed to do it? You know, I've had a secretary for the last 10 years, I want to take that secretary, uh, there's a paralegal that's just a fabulous paralegal, I want the paralegal, and I've got an associate I've been friends with forever. I mean, how am I supposed to do this, Roger? Well, the best way to do it is, again, we talked about going in and coming up with a plan, we, hit, we check off the items, this is one of the items you check off. There's a, there's a, that's a, the ethical and the, the, the proper way to do it is to say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these clients, these clients work with, with these associates, so these associates know them. I would like to take associate X, Y, and Z and secretary A, B, C. And I'd like to go ahead and make them an offer to come with me. It's an offer. If they choose to say no, they stay here. The practical side of that is if you are taking clients out from the firm, revenue away from the firm, and those associates and those secretaries are working on the clients that you're taking, the likelihood is, is that that law firm is not going to have the ability to continue to keep them on as a resource because the revenue isn't there to pay them. So they're not necessarily going to object unless it's like the star associate who's working on multiple matters for multiple clients and then you might get into a little bit of a, of a battle. But again, that comes down to the associate's decision. I'm going to go ask if I should go talk to them. But once I get the notice that I'm leaving, and they say, no, you can't talk to them. Too bad, I'm not going to go talk to them. I don't think there's any ethical violation there. You know, that's an observation. I don't know. I, mean, I can't formulate this to a, a question, but it almost seems like some attorneys leaving who are the only ones working on a file, it's almost in the client's best interest that those attorneys take that file, as opposed to the firm's best interest that that revenue-generating client stay with the firm. It almost seems like there's a, you know, a little dichotomy there. Yeah, no disagreement. I think what Roger's saying in, in this case is just let everybody know, talk to them, to ask for permission. I think it's better to ask for permission that, uh, in advance than ask for forgiveness later. It's one of the rare instances where I agree with that. <laughs> so you don't get it. So let's say that we don't want to go to the managing partner and ask for permission. What's another way to do it? That, that's a money back guarantee that you'll be just fine. How else can we do it? See, when I taught 
And here for 25 years, my students always say, just lecture us for three hours. I don't do that. <laughs> so what's another way to accomplish the same goal? How can I do this? In, instead of going to somebody for permission, what's another way of accomplishing the same thing? How can I do this? Anybody have any thoughts how I do that? Just resign. Open up your own firm. And then you're more than welcome to, to do your normal advertisement, your normal, but put something in Craigslist. Go to the bar. Go, go to Teresa and say, put, put something on our, on our website, soliciting for, for uh, attorneys. There's other ways to do it. So, uh, but the point of it is just to unilaterally make that decision uh, is potentially fraught with danger. Well, and again, there is a practice side. Glenn brings up a good point. That is if you're the only attorney working on that file or you're the only attorney who knows that area of the law and you leave, that client is not being served if you, you know, somebody now all of a sudden is going to, you know, they've been practicing criminal law their whole life, now they're going to try and take on lender foreclosure action. I mean, that's, that's not going to do the client any good. And the client's not going to put up with that. So the practical aspect is that those clients are going to end up following you. And so as Dick said, worst case comes, you know, worst case scenario is say, see you later, go set up your own shop, so now your notifications. Okay, so one thing we've learned so far is the client comes first. That, that, that is a paramount objective of ethical considerations, is our personal interests don't come first. The money that we're going to derive is not going to come first. It's the client's interests that come first. So that has to prevail over all other considerations. And this is the quote that Roger was talking about earlier, which is clients are not merchandise. So let's chat about formal opinions, and, and whether they're uh, California bar or ABA bar. And also we have in here model rules that are coming up. So if I'm a judge, is that going to be binding or persuasive? It's going to be persuasive. Authority. Judges are judges. They'll do what they're going to do. So the same thing is true with ABA. So in California, uh, we have a committee in the state bar called COCRAP, and they're the ones that write the rules of professional responsibility and the rules of professional conduct. And, and by the way, these rules are on the state bar website. Uh, it's very easy to, uh, to, to download them. Uh, and, and the current version on the website uh, is 2013, California Rules of Professional Conduct. The committee in California, the state bar, COCRAP, spent 10 years, 10 years, writing revised rules. They went to the Supreme Court a couple years ago, and the Supreme Court said, no, we're not using any of them. So they're starting all over again. And what we have been told is that they are carefully looking at the ABA model rules to try to get the ABA model rules uh, consistent with the California Rules of Professional Conduct. So I think that's a work in progress. Hopefully it will happen during our lifetime, but I'm not going to bet on it. So that, that's going to that's gonna happen. So um, same thing with respect to uh, clients coming first is we have to make sure that there's no prejudice to the client. So uh, using Roger's uh, comments that we're going to talk to, for example, a managing partner first to get consensus about how we're going to do this. What's in the best interest of the client? Let the client decide. And, and, and if the client wants to stay with the firm, then make that transition as smooth as possible to whatever lawyer is going to be with the firm. The client wants to come with you, so, so be it. Communication is the key. Is the key. Unilateral action is not the key. And it's also a rule of professional responsibility to make sure that the client's kept informed about who uh, is representing the client. Uh, and whatever changes in the status of the employment status happen. So I was working with the opposing counsel today on a matter where he's leaving this Friday, uh, and he's letting clients know. He's letting the opposing counsel know who the new attorney is that's going to be taking over. Done very, very well, very professionally. So we talked about soliciting, uh, and there is a rule, 1-400, uh, that deals with solicitation uh, and uh, what the motives are when it's appropriate, when it isn't, uh, how we're going to be communicating. And I don't think there's any question that once we have permission of a managing partner or who's ever we're working with at the firm to put whatever we're doing in writing, just like we talked about when you're going to a new firm to have everything in writing, same thing is true when you're leaving. 
and, and so what you want is, is is something so that there's no misunderstanding about what the responsibilities are. And that would be every, everything from uh, unfinished work on, on the case uh, to letting the client know if there's any delays in, in getting back to the client with work that's been promised. So the, the rules with respect to uh, how solicitation can exist uh, it is pretty much what we've talked about, but we, we've got to be sensitive to uh, how that's communicated so that there can't be any ambiguity in making sure the client's objectives comes first and, and, and how that's going to work with respect to uh, avoiding any business forms. So let's talk about fiduciary obligations. I, I thought this was interesting in, in a couple cases that deal with fiduciary obligations. Under what circumstances do fiduciary obligations exist among persons in a law firm? Partners, by law, by operation of law, partners owe each other duties of uh, fiduciary duties. We don't have any LLCs practicing law in California. Um, shareholders as well, especially if they're a majority to minority shareholders. You are, board, you are on a board of directors if you're, if you're practicing in a corporate format. If you are an officer of the corporation, if you are designated for some reason or another as an officer of a partnership, you owe fiduciary duties to that entity as well as to the other shareholders and the board members. So what about a closely held corporation? Now I've got a professional corporation with five shareholders. Different, different animal. Different but animal you, because you don't have a board of directors with one. Still have shareholder responsibilities, but you don't have the board of directors. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, I don't see too many closely held corporations anymore. Uh, you did for a while, but I don't see a whole lot of them these days. Instead, people tend to practice in the LLP format. But sure, and, and typically, even if it is in the corporate form, <coughs> you're going to have a shareholder agreement, and that shareholder agreement is usually going to have language that contractually will provide for fiduciary obligations. Right, and, and I. I and Dick brings up a good point. We talked about the, the model rules. It's kind of the same. I, I look at the, the model rules with regard to this type of, of conduct the same way I do with the California Corporations Code. I really don't want to be in a position if there's an issue to have to default to the code or the, the rules to tell me what is going to happen. I would rather have a document in place that says, if, if this happens, then this happens. And I would rather have that signed and in place and not let court interpret what the corporation's code or the model rules may mean and what, what outcome that may hold for you. That's an interesting issue. So how do I handle ADR provisions either with associates or with partners? Well again, with partners it's a different that status. With the, again, practicing their employment a lot more than I do, but with associates as employees you have different rules concerning arbitration, and whether it's one-sided, fair, who pays, all those other rules. With the partners, it's a different story. You can pretty much negotiate whatever you like. And we, we you know, I've been in, in partnerships where we have ADR provisions that require mediation, et cetera. Yeah, so you know what? That's a good point. I, uh, I hadn't thought about that until now. Uh, it would behoove us to think about where there are allegations of any uh, ethical violations to have them resolved uh, outside of a, a court proceeding. So if I'm in a shareholder, if I'm in a corporate, a professional corporation, or if I'm in an LLP, uh, it would, uh, for partners, uh, it would be of assistance, it seems to me, to have some ADR provision uh, in advance to try to resolve that dispute. Uh, if, it's, if we're in the corporate forum, I can do the same thing with the shareholder agreement. With respect to associates, uh, we can do the same thing in a properly drafted employment agreement that does coincide with California law about who pays. But what's of interest to me in doing that, it, it's a dispute resolution proceeding that I think you can have a, a more informed um, uh, trier of fact that resolves the dispute. Uh, and my experience, I don't know about yours, Roger, but my experience when I've been involved in law firm partnership disputes to go to court, uh, it's judges that I don't want to see us. No, and I don't think you want to see them. I mean, these are judges in front of whom you're probably going to appear if you're a litigator. Uh, if you, even if you're not a litigator, you, you may still 
you have a reputation, you don't necessarily want all your dirty laundry aired in public. For that reason alone, mediation coupled with confidentiality provisions, etc., then you're better off to go to a, somewhere and have someone resolve those disputes before someone runs down to the, to the court and files a, a TRO to stop you from taking clients and files out of the firm. Yeah. If, if for no other reason you've got confidentiality, it's not a public document. Correct. So that's that, that's probably in the best interest, both economically and, and uh, uh, every other way to try to resolve disputes. But I'm curious, in terms of fiduciary duties, uh, <coughs> employees don't owe an, an employer a fiduciary duty. So if I'm an associate, I don't have a fiduciary duty to, to the law firm, but I do have a duty of loyalty that, that's codified in the labor code. So uh, and, and in addition to the common law remedies that we've already talked about that the, that the partnership or the law firm has, so I, I'd be sensitive about those. One, one thing I, I bring up, uh, I will bring up because it has, I've actually litigated this not too long ago. I, my client litigated it. And that is a situation, California passed a law a few years ago that uh, came down and said, while you can't prohibit an employee from competing, there's no, no non-competition law for employees in California. However, if you can prove that that employee was setting up a competitive business while he or she was on your payroll, there is a basis to go after them and recover those wages that you paid them during the time that they were setting up this competing business. So all the more reason to be up front, communicate, have an understanding of what's going on um, in the case that somebody might be particularly vindictive in the event uh, that your associate was actually leaving a wage. So Roger, I'm working for a law firm and I think I want to leave in about two months. What can I do now legitimately to plan for my departure? What should I be thinking about? I think you can, I think you can legitimately look at insurance options. I think you can legitimately look at a third. Lend, if you need loans, if you need a line of credit, those those type of things. Um, those are things that I think you can look at. Office space, again, not doing it on, if this has got to be on your own time to be able to prove that you did it on a weekend or after hours or something along those lines. Okay, so I'm looking for space. I check about insurance. Uh, if I need a loan, I can go to a lender. Uh, can I sol start soliciting for uh, a receptionist or uh, uh, my, my support staff, is it, can I do that? I, I wouldn't advise, I would not advise someone to do that. Now, whether or not ethically that, that you, can, you can do that, if that gets you into any problem, you may, be, you may be able to find ways around that, but I would just say that the closer you get to a situation where you're actually looking to set up a business publicly like that, I think the, the closer you get to uh, that third rail. So now I've done everything you told me to do. I've gone to my boss and said, you know, things aren't working out, I want to leave. So can we do this logically? Can we coordinate the communication to the clients? Can we let them have the choice? Can we work on a really good marketing letter? And, and contrary to Roger's best advice, the worst case scenario is the, the managing partner says, you know what, the answer is no, no, and no. And you can leave right now and don't let the door hitch on the way out. Leave your keys. Leave your fob there. Leave everything. Your credit card. You're you're gone, pal. And all of a sudden, I walk out, and I've got my briefcase, and that's all I have. That's all I have. What can I do now, Roger, with respect to trying to communicate with my clients? I know who my clients are. Can I start uh, dialing for dollars and dialing for clients and saying, "Hey, I'm no longer there. I'm now in Nuco. I want you to come on down." How do I do this? Well, I think, number one, we just saw the slide. You have an obligation to notify them that you're no longer with the firm. You've been terminated, however you want to put that. Uh, you've been terminated with the firm and no longer with them. At that point, the likelihood is that the client is going to say, well, where are you going? What are you going to do? And your answer is going to be either I'm going out on my own, I'm joining another firm, or I don't know. <laughs> it could be all of the above. At that point, then, then again, I think Dick said to mention before, the likelihood is that the client is going to say, well, I, I want to go. I want you to go. You have all my files. You know all my information. You've been representing me for 10 years. I want to go with you. Um, so at that point, I think you're, you're fine. Same same thing again. Now you're out the door. This is this is just like resigning. So now all bets are off pretty much at this point. You can put an ad in the paper to solicit receptionists, associates, etc. Go to the Bar Association, post it on uh, their website. 
Okay, so now I'm really angry, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, Roger, not only do I want my clients, I want every one of their clients, because I'm going to get a whole bunch of lawyers, and I want to call, contact every single one of that firm's clients, and I want to solicit everybody. Can I do that? No. That, there's, a specific, <laughs> there's a specific rule that says you cannot solicit other clients of the firm. That is that, that you cannot do. So how do I do it? What's the best way to do that? Well, I mean, a number of ways to do it. Again, if you... You have an ethical obligation to notify the clients. You call them up and tell them you're leaving. You don't need to ask, you don't need to solicit anything. So I'm leaving the firm, I'm gonna go set up such and such. I have an ethical obligation to advise you of this. I don't know, the truth is, I don't know who will be taking over your, your file, your case, your matter, your your matter, plural. Um, I didn't I, I tried to broach this with the managing partner, tried to arrange a timeline and make sure this all got taken care of. It didn't work out, I'm, I'm now gone. I don't have any information, any further information to tell you. And just sort of bait that hook and let the, let the client bite and go from there. Again, client's best interest is, they're gonna ask you, is there anybody at that firm who can handle my work? No. Is there anybody at that firm who knows anything about what you do for me? No. Best interest of the client is to be represented by an attorney who knows the client, knows the client's matters, can adequately represent the client. So from time to time, I have a number of folks, not necessarily law firms, thank goodness, who <coughs> are in this situation where uh, they, they're out the door, uh, and they say, what can we do? We're going to talk about covenants not to compete in a yes. uh, So uh, what can you do? You're, you're now gone. You, your own clients, I agree with Roger, you certainly want to, your former clients, you want to notify them. I think you have that ethical duty. But what about the rest <coughs> of the potential clients that you work with? So what's the way to do that? The way to do that is not cherry pick. The way to do that is not take the biggest client of the firm that you had nothing to do with and say, call that, that client and say, come on down, we can take care of you. That, that would be improper in my view. But there are ways to do it. And one of the most common ways that I found is, is you can work with a number of direct marketing firms and you, by SIC code and by demographics, by zip code, you can have target mailings that are what I call tombstone announcements, which is pleased to announce that John Q. Smith, uh, formerly with XYZ Firm, is now uh, forming NUCO at 1234 Main Street, and here's his contact information. That's a tombstone ad. Perfectly fine. It's, yep. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mailing to a general segment of the population, and some people might see it, some might not. Whether you do this through the internet, through you do, do it through whatever medium it is, but it's a general announcement, it's something like that. And oftentimes that gets to the same, the same level. One thing I, that it probably comes up a little bit later, but the beauty of what Dick is suggesting is that it does not involve any hint and you're using confidential trade secret information because to the extent that you have confidentiality, non-disclosure obligations, you, you can't violate those. You can't use that information that you gained about that client and contact them and say, hey, I know you're paying this firm X dollars an hour, I'll do your same work for Y dollars an hour or less. That's confidential trade secret information regarding that client. This is not. This is a public source. I didn't get the information. I contacted a third party, told them I want to solicit these types of clients in this type of region. They went and gave me a list and they some of them will even send it out for you. Hold on yards. I will tell you one thing that does might irk some people, because I've, I've been involved in this before with other uh, clients of mine, is the bit about formerly of XYZ firm. That that sometimes, will, will, even though it's perfectly permissible, sometimes people will, will look at that as sort of like I'm poking them in the chest a little bit. Yeah, fair. And, and by the way, just one second, Dale, the, 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 you can also go to trade association, go to the chamber, and, and go to a mixer yeah. or, or put an ad in the or, or go to the business council or go to wherever. Right. You're welcome to do that. Dan? Well, I was going to ask, and I, maybe you'll address it later, but I guess my question in this particular discussion is there, there's the duties that you have to quote your clients, and then there is an inability of you to be able to solicit the firm's clients. How is the delineation made in terms of? you know, who, which clients at the firm are considered your clients? Is it based on if you brought the business in, if you spoke to that client ever on the telephone, if you were the primary attorney on the file? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> I mean, the, there's, the, you know, the, the line gets, it starts out very bright and it gets fuzzy. Sure. Is it a client you brought in and you worked exclusively on and you, you're the only person at the firm they know? Clearly that client you can talk to. Now, the client you bring in, but let's just say that, that uh, you bring in a matter that you know, you're a litigator in a firm and you bring in a family law matter and you give the family law attorney, well, you're never going to work on that case. But you know the client. The client contacted you. That's a little fuzzier. Did you ever work with them? You brought the client in. Probably still permissible. Um, you know, some client of the firm like Dick says the biggest fish in the pond, and you've never touched that client. But everybody in the firm knows who that client is. That's probably a different animal. So and that's one bright line. The other bright line is one I indicated where you've done everything, and there's a lot of gray in between. <laughs> so clients are always asking me these days, Dick, just give me the answer. I want a black and white answer. Okay. We've never heard that before. So my black and white answer is, you're never going to go wrong if you don't talk to them at all. Right. That's number one. And number two, you're not going to go wrong if you get permission in writing from the firm to say this is the plan of action. In between is the huge area, and that's that's always the issue. So Roger, covenants not to compete. Okay. <laughs> so we've got two scenarios: one with an associate and one with a partner. Enforceable? Let's take the associate. Associate, employee. Not enforceable. Former employee, no covenant not to compete. What can you do? You can prohibit them from soliciting clients by using confidential information. You can prohibit them from soliciting employees from using confidential information. Again, it has to be reasonable in terms of restrict the time restriction and geographic limitation. Um, so then, partners, if you are buying them out of their practice when they're leaving, and part of that buyout includes a goodwill component, then you can legally include in your buyout agreement or in a separate agreement a covenant not to compete, which prohibits them from competing with you by, with, again, reasonable limitations, both in terms of duration and geographic limitation, and also limited to the clients in which you work. So for example, if you're a family law firm, you can't tell them you can never practice any kind of law ever in the world because you bought out their family law goodwill. You didn't buy out a criminal practice, a business practice, a banking practice, etc. So that's the, the down and dirty. There's more to it than that. But. So, Roger, I have a 1% interest. Dan's my boss, and, and now I'm leaving. And, and so we have a covenant not to compete that says I can't work. All I have is a 1% interest. Is that enough to, to trigger the covenant not to compete? There's a goodwill component to it, yes and no. The courts also look at is that there meaningful, is there a meaningful purchase there? Meaningful ownership. Did you really have a, a, an interest in the goodwill of the firm? Legally, I say one percent, yes, I'm buying that back, you have a one percent interest, but realistically, <coughs> was that enough? And courts will go back and forth with it. Again, if you've got a one percent interest in IBM, that's one thing. If you got a one percent interest in a in a, a five or six or ten person law firm, that's another thing. I see this frequently, actually, where closely held companies want to give a 1% interest to employees to try to trigger them. And, and my view of it is any de minimis um, type uh, ownership of that per, uh, relationship for that purpose, because that's the reason they're doing it, I, I don't buy it. So. I, I agree. I mean, I think, again, you have to, re you have to remember there's a you know, covenants not to compete or the attempt to enforce covenants not to compete are two sided coin. And it's that in the event that you try and enforce an unenforceable covenant not to compete and extend it beyond what the courts would deem to be reasonable, you could actually be hit with a complaint back the other way saying that what you are doing, what you are engaging in an illegal restraint of trade, which carries with it not only damages but attorney's fees. So let's talk over a few things that we just uh, learned, and that is uh, a joint letter to the extent feasible, which uh, is... Uh, with, from the withdrawing attorney about what areas of practice they have, the date of the departure, uh, whether the firm is going to continue to handle similar matters, uh, who's responsible for the ongoing work, uh, the client has the right to decide, uh, and the client can have all the papers and property. So we've talked about that, those are all good points. Uh, notifications of client can't be misleading or cursive, uh, and we, we don't want to malign former law firm or withdrawing partners. We want to do this professionally all the way through even though sometimes it uh, gets the best of us. Uh, solicitation of at-will employees uh, is not actionable, but my view of it is the exceptions more often than not swallow up the rule, and, and we've already talked about some of those business stories. So hypothetical two. So now David interviews with the firm he likes, the interviewing partner, 
as stated for a list of his current clients, matters past and expected billings, revenues for those clients and matters, list of all of his clients and matters he's handled over the last three years. Do you think that would ever happen? Would any, would any firm that's soliciting you or any recruiter ever ask those questions? You better believe it. What do you think? That's what they want to do. They want to know what's your book of business or they want to know what slot are you going to fill. And, and, and when you're uh, looking to move, typically you're filling a vacancy, you're filling a practice area that's needed, uh, they're starting a new firm, uh, they're, they're looking for a particular area of expertise that you might have, uh, they're looking at rainmaking capabilities, they want to know what you're going to bring over. So those questions are going to come up. Those questions are going to come up. <coughs> so one of David's clients is a small technology company uh, and in, in the middle of very confidential merger discussions, the client doesn't want this disclosed. Can David provide that information? What do you think? Can David say, I'm working with XYZ company, and by the way, uh, I've billed uh, uh, $200,000 in the last six months. Uh, it looks like the next billing will probably be at least that, if not more. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a, a deal that we hope to conclude in the next few months. I've worked with a client for, I don't know, two or three years. I'm sure they're going to come over with me because I've got a really good relationship with them. What about that? Can, can I provide any of that information to the, to the firm with whom I'm recruiting? What do you think? It seems that you could potentially say that you have a client and a name and a company, but any of the other information seems to be confidential. If I'm the attorney for a, a company, it seems that that's almost public knowledge, right? With respect to billing and all that other stuff, that's something that would be more proprietary to my work at the firm. But, I mean, the identity, I guess there's a clear line there. It seems like the most I could disclose at all. I think I'd go the opposite. I'd right? be big about the client name and say it's a small technology on a general basis. And if you don't want the name disclosed, I'd want this much. Right. Mm -hmm. Typically, these things, I do a lot of M&A work. So this comes up in every facet. Um, and I do a lot of it with, with medical practitioners as well as uh, I've with lawyers, engineers, and architects. And you, this is a phased approach. You know, you, you start out, you know, you, you start out shaking hands, you know, you, before you start dating kind of thing. So you say, okay, well, initially, yeah, let's meet. We think this that we've got a, a, some good synergy here. I do a lot of work with insurance brokers as well when it comes up. And let's, let's okay, now looks good, kind of philosophy. What are we talking about? What types of work do you do? What types of clients do you have? To your point, where... You're not disclosing anything other than, in general, I do this, 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 and this. Okay, that's kind of what we do. I think that, that there's some, you know, we can have a symbiotic relationship here where we can both benefit from a, a merger of some sort, acquisition of some sort. So now we get down into, well, now do we actually have to worry, law firms have to do, worry about this more so than other firms, do we have any conflicts? There's no way to run a conflict without disclosing names of the clients. But again, you don't have to disclose anything in particular. You kind of describe your general practice area. And here are a list of, and maybe it's only your your 20 biggest clients or 10 biggest clients. Let's start there. Do we have any conflicts? If a conflict arises, then it's like, well, let's get into some of the potential conflict arises. What are some of the particulars? And that's where you have to be a little bit careful about what you can and can't disclose. Uh, but it does, it, you know, you don't just... Show up one day and say, okay, here's all the clients and all the, and all the information about them and here's everything I, I have. It, it does, this typically doesn't work though. So I'm going to take three steps back because I think this is a really important issue. So I have a client, I don't do as much M&A work as Roger does, but I do some. So I have a client right now that's in an M&A uh, merger and acquisition uh, transaction. And uh, uh, I don't want to say my client would kill me because I don't think they would kill me. They'd be really angry. Uh, and, and my view of it is it would also be a state bar violation because these are very confidential communications. And if I disclose the name of the client, uh, I would be proverbially shot. It uh, would not be a happy day because it is confidential. And my view of it is, probably like many of you, where we've been at social occasions with a spouse or significant other or a son or daughter, and, and we meet people and, and they have no clue that half the group there is my clients. Not a clue. And I don't tell them. It's the, if the client wants to disclose it, they may. But my view of it is that client identity is, is confidential unless otherwise given <coughs> permission to disclose. Uh, oftentimes, fee agreements, I just saw one with Big Law, 
and Big Law has a fee agreement where they said they have permission to put my client's uh, identity on their website as a, as a client. And they got express written permission for that. Now, of course, I crossed it out and said, no, I'm not going to do that. You don't have permission unless we get consideration, like a lot of money. Like instead of $1,000 an hour, it's only $800 an hour. So, uh, but I think the client identity is, is, is a huge issue. And, and I think initially, as Roger said, I agree, it's the dance. And, and so I'm not going to release any of that information unless I either have permission or I'm going to get some type of non-disclosure agreement, uh, a confidentiality. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean first, in, in these transactions, you don't even say hello without an NDA. Tell me that. I mean, that's, that's right. number one. And then you go, go from there. One thing I will bring up in case anybody doesn't know, I just found this out this last year, is that people who practice in the EU, it is absolutely forbidden to disclose your client's name. You cannot do it. So it makes running conflicts really interesting. You have to get permission from the client to disclose the name for the purpose of running a conflict. So for example, if they had a matter in the States, they, were, they had a presence here and they were being sued or wanted to sue somebody here and you wanted to run a conflict check to see whether or not your firm can represent them, you'd have to go to the lawyer so I need written permission from your client to, to, for you to disclose the name to me so I can run a conflict check here. And it's, uh, it's interesting. So I, I think this is really an important issue. So now let's talk about, uh, I, I want the, 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 I'm now talking to them, uh, what else can I disclose, okay? Uh, can I disclose uh, that I'm involved in technology? Sure, that, that's my skill set. So I'm involved in the technology set. Can I disclose <coughs> financials? Can I disclose uh, what the billable hours have been? Can I show for the last three years uh, what the average is on a monthly or annualized basis with respect to productivity? Uh, how many hours I bill, how many hours, what, what percent of that's been uh, collected, uh, what's out there in terms of an aging report, can I disclose all that? Well, again, a lot of that information belongs to the firm. Right. So all of that, you know, you're talking about client billing information, hourly rates, etc., depending on the nature of your agreements, either employment agreement or handbook or non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement or some type of IP agreement, You've got to be a little bit careful of what, how much of that can you disclose without violating any of your, your employment restrictions. So now I'm being solicited. I'm in a really fancy restaurant. I'm being wine and dine. They really want to, to rope me into the firm. And, and you know how that is. You want to, you want to play along. You, you want to say, wow, this is a firm I'd really like to be with. And, and you want to reveal this information. How, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to disclose? How do I handle that situation? You have to a lot, of, a lot of vagaries. I mean, you have to again, plus it, you know, NDA type situation. But a lot of it is going to be just, hey, I generate this much billable. My hourly rate is in this range, and those those type of things. You're not saying I bill this client this much money. I bill or I my practice area builds this much per hour, etc. You're giving somebody kind of a general information without disclosing anything that could identify that information to a particular. Here, here. So if I'm the firm that's interviewing the potential candidate, that's what I want to hear. If I have a candidate that now's want to just divulge everything that, that's confidential, I'm not pleased about that. That's a preview of coming attractions. That's a freaking train wreck. I don't want to have that happen. So that concerns me a lot. I, I, I don't want to go in that direction. So I'd rather have someone that doesn't do that. Moreover, as an applicant, I don't want to promise a rose garden. I don't want to say, listen, my billables have been X, I'm going to be able to do that for you. In fact, I can, I can add another 10% to that. you got to be kidding. We don't know that. I don't really know what that client's going to do. I don't know that. So I, I'd be really cautious about how to handle that. So David now says, well, I'm interested in you, okay? So what kind of information can I solicit from the firm that I'm thinking about joining? I went very quickly over the list earlier about information to ask that firm. Mm -hmm. so, so now I'm interviewing with Glenn. He's the owner of his firm. And I want to say, Glenn, uh, show me your financials for the last three years. I want to see them. I, I, I want to see uh, what your receivables are. Uh, I, I want to know uh, how much money you make and how, how much money uh, you paid associates. Uh, can I ask him that? Anything wrong with that? <laughs> right. You can ask him. No I mean, harm in the asking. There's no yeah. harm in asking. Yeah. <laughs> Glenn, I'm going to say, well, I don't think this so. This is a glass of wine, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you can ask. Again, I'd be particularly concerned about client identity and client conflicts. That, that's huge for me. Uh, that's huge. Uh, it's an attorney's duty to maintain embodiment, the confidence in every peril to himself or herself to preserve secrets of his or her client. That's actually out of the B&B section. Uh, and and the, B the Business Professions Code section uh, 6068 uh, uh, has a whole litany of, of ethical responsibilities for attorneys, and this is one of them. And, and I just think this is huge. I, I think it's just a, a really important issue that sometimes we have a tendency to overlook. Uh, we should not be revealing anything that uh, is a secret or confidential to a client. Dick, can I ask a question? Of course. It seems that in this situation, if you're trying to get the informed consent of a client of interviewing for a potential new position, I, I know from this great seminar that I need to get the informed consent of the client if I want to be able to disclose in my interview the identity of a client. Um, it kind of goes back to, well, if I haven't notified the firm that I'm planning on leaving or doing anything, they <coughs> asking for the informed consent of a client to reveal their identity. And if it's informed consent, I would have to reveal to the client then that I'm planning on leaving the firm. Would that run afoul of the prior, you know, obligations that we discussed earlier? Sure. Good question. Yeah. Again, I don't think that you can reveal a lot of that information. You know, it's it's a little bit different in terms of where you are. If there's public information, for example, if you are, if you've got a, a case on file, and it's in a public court, and you're the attorney of record. Yeah, you can probably reveal that. It's, it's not client confidential information. Whatever that matter is public information that you and that and your firm, the current firm, are representing that client. Outside of that, unless it's somehow it's, it's been published in a newspaper that the, or somewhere else, some internet source, whatever, that it's in the public domain in terms of who that client is, I think you need to be careful about what you can and can't represent. And that's why I say, the, you know, we talked about these negotiations start very vague and they, they kind of, as, as they get closer, at some point in time you're going to say, okay, I feel confident enough where this is going somewhere and they feel confident enough that they're going to make you an offer or you're going to, you're going to accept an offer at that point in time, somewhere along that way, that continuum, you decide I'm going to go notify the managing partner and say, I'm leaving, here's what's going on. So Roger and I are both realistic. We, we, I just learned this expression the other day. We, we've been to more than one rodeo. And, and it's because not from my part of the country. I'm from Texas. That's a very common expression. Uh, Ain't my first rodeo. I, had, I hadn't heard that. So I'm not from Texas, thank goodness. <laughs> so uh, realistically, does this happen? Probably not. What we're trying to cover is what the, uh, the rules are with respect to professional conduct, because it's really a deterrent effect. So, it's uh, not that we're condoning violating these, we're not at all, but we're also realistic enough to know that from time to time, it's been known to happen that uh, people don't follow this sage advice that Roger's giving and, and, and go, go ahead and communicate with prospective law firms or employers and reveal information that they shouldn't be doing. So my admonition would be don't uh, follow the rules. I think it's, it's the right thing to do. One thing I would say is that you have relationships with, with these clients, and it's the client who would be harmed by these disclosures, not necessarily the law firm. If the client is not going to, you know, if the client's not going to pick up the phone and call the state bar on you, then you're, you're probably okay. And you know the problem if you have discussions with the client, a relationship with the client, to know what sensitivities he, she, or it has, and to know what you can and can't disclose, and what they would, would prefer you not disclose and keep confidential. So uh, you should also know that when a complaint's filed with the state bar, there's an investigator assigned to that, and the investigator actually follows up. There is follow-up with that. The good news is that most of the complaints with the state bar, thank goodness, uh, are, are not found to be valid for a whole variety of reasons, but nonetheless, it's an experience we don't want to go through. So there's some model rules. Uh, these are ABA model rules. As I said, uh, it's not clear uh, to what extent uh, that these model rules will be followed in California or adopted. Uh, but conflicts of interest are important. Uh, the the attorney-client privilege is paramount. We've talked about that. Uh, so once we know that uh, we have permission to disclose, uh, either through uh, existing uh, law firm relationships or with client permission, 
uh, then we're able to do so. So uh, we also uh, know that there's certain uh, communication that we would not disclose. So a corporate takeover, for example, that's not been publicly announced. Uh, so another one that that client comes in and there's a, a possibility of a divorce. These are confidential communications where there's no public record of this. Uh, there's a criminal investigation not led to a public charge. Obviously, these are serious matters and, and confidentiality is paramount. So let's go to another hypothetical. So David decides to join the new firm. Uh, before he gives notice to his old firm, he downloads all of his personal files from the firm's, uh, firm's server onto a portable hard drive, as well as electronic files for matters in which he was involved where he was at the firm. So can he do that? Can he download all of his personal stuff? Uh, can he also take electronic files where he was involved in that before? That touches on some of what we talked about. So what about that? Well, I would think even the smallest of firms nowadays have canned uh, employee handbooks that deal with this and basically says all this information belongs to the firm. It's the firm's computer, it's the firm's phone, the firm's iPad. The information that's in that, the information that's generated while you're at the firm belongs to the firm. The documents that you generate belong to the firm. That, that's yours. And that, that belongs to the firm. There, there is, uh, the, the, there is a, a rule out there, and again, Dick practices in this area a lot more than I do, probably knows more about it than I do, that talks about the fact that in the absence of an IP assignment, things that you create while you're out at a firm do belong to you. So in the absence of something that says they belong to the firm, they're yours. And that's why you have to be a little bit careful what you create. In the absence of anything that says it belongs to the firm, you probably have an argument that says, I created these, I should be able to, to take these with me. But client contact information, or uh, off your, uh, download, uh, your Outlook, downloading your Outlook, taking entire files of the, the clients that you didn't create, other clients you didn't work on, all that stuff is, is bad news. And I have a, that's going on right now, not with a law firm, but I'm dealing with that right now in another, and we have a forensic expert going through the computer because we know the documents were taken. We just don't know what. We don't know when. But we'll find out pretty soon because all that, that stuff never goes away. It's a permanent record of that. So in, in reality, uh, what happens is when someone leaves, they often do want to take what uh, they've stored on the computer in, in some type of a drive that's personal stuff. Uh, and Roger's correct. Uh, prudent employers will have a handbook that's going to say, listen, anything on this computer belongs to the firm doesn't belong to you individually. So the admonition would be to employees, don't store anything personally on there. And if you do, we have a right to look at everything and, and, and you can't take it. And by the way, not only does this uh, exist with respect to uh, your, your uh, desktop, it also exists with your iPad and your iPhone and any other device that you have. We have a right to that. So prudent employers these days are making sure that uh, BYOD doesn't occur, bring your own device. We don't want that. We want to say to the firm, here's your device, and when you leave, you get the device back. You don't get to keep it. So for those uh, imprudent employers that don't follow that advice, then depending upon the nature of uh, what their handbook is or other contractual provisions, they often do want to have a look at those devices, and, and they want to do exactly what Roger said, which is get a computer person in there to say, okay, we, we want to take a look at it. When it gets to litigation, there are forensics in there, and that's exactly what they do. And if you get to that level, it gets really messy. Very and and not, expensive. And, and not and, and expensive and not pleasant. Because Is there anything that, on the flip side of it, the other side of the breakup, the, um, the continuing partnership, is there any obligation on their part to alert the person who's left or to delete files that are of a personal nature or a personal and business nature that they kind of carelessly left all over the computers and well I mean we just talked about that the, the, they just mentioned it most of these handbooks nowadays just the, the can form handbooks to say if it's on our device it's ours so there's no <coughs> obligation for them to delete it whether or not they choose to delete it is up to them so tip in practicality what I do with employers is I say, listen, I don't want anybody's personal stuff, but what I, I, I want someone to observe either what they're doing or I'm going to have my own IT person download their economic stuff and uh, their personal stuff and give it to them on the <coughs> drive and say, here, here you go. Yeah. They've got you know, pictures of their kids or their family vacation, that kind of stuff. You know? Sometimes it'll be like financial data. They'll like keep their 
right. all of their financial. Yeah, like, like, like Dick said, I, I, I agree. I would probably just destroy it to the extent again, again, with the computers, electronic files, nothing's never really destroyed, but at least deleted off the system, so it can't be accessed by other people. Okay, so let's see. Uh, he then goes, as we just said, to the contact list on the iPhone, uh, and he wants to have all that. He, he wants to be able to communicate with colleagues. He then notifies his clients he's leaving, tells them they're free to select whatever counsel they wish, and offer to remain their counsel. So now he's left the firm. So as we talked about before, there, there's different protocol for why you're still at the firm and when you leave the firm. We've already talked about the protocol for after you leave the firm of how the appropriate uh, uh, conduct should be uh, in terms of interacting with clients. So a lot of clients say right away, uh, we're going to jump ship and they, and they want to go with him. And typically that does happen when an associate or a partner, whoever, has worked uh, uh, substantially a long time with the client and the client has a, a client trust relationship with that attorney. That frequently happens. Uh, and and uh, then David tells the managing partner is leaving, forwards the emails about the clients. Uh, the managing partner then says he needs to leave, uh, and he's escorted from the building. I don't know. Does that ever happen? Ever <laughs> happen? Anybody escorted from the building? Yeah, it's on a, a number of occasions. So we get to have one little horror story. So I had a client that uh, actually it was a uh, closely held entity. My client was the president. Uh, it was uh, a, uh, a, shareholder, a minority shareholder that was also an officer of the company. And so uh, he, the, the minority shareholder drove, <laughs> I should have <allowed. laughs> drove a truck out uh, to the meeting and the president said, I need to fire him. And he had cause. There, there was a legitimate basis to call it. That wasn't in dispute. So uh, at that meeting, uh, he fired him, got the keys to the truck, got the keys to the office, got his credit cards, and the guy said, well, how am I supposed to get home? It's like 15 miles away. So I said to my client, call a cab for crying out loud, okay? Don't just have to walk out the door. And he did, thank goodness. He called the cab and, and he made sure he had money and, and we sent him off. So uh, it does happen that somebody says, uh, by the way, you're escorted from the building. What I'm always concerned about when that happens is, is how they're escorted from the building. Because my own view is uh, there can be uh, causes of action for defamation with respect to the conduct that exists and whether or not someone's treating that person in such a manner that the rest of the employees believe that person's a crook or a thief or you call the police and the police escort them from the building. I, I've got to be really yeah. careful. I mean, typically when I'm talking to clients about that, I'll say, look, if, if that's the deal, I agree. It's not a great idea to have this grown employees around. Have him or her just leave the office. Make arrangements with them for them to come back and collect their belongings after hours on the weekend where they can be supervised, but they don't have to do it in front of everybody. They don't have to make a big scene about it. They quietly remove their, you know, their personal belongings. Okay, so now David leaves. The managing partner says, wait a minute, I'm really concerned about those clients. I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm calling all the clients that I know David's worked with, and I'm going to tell those clients that David has no trial experience, and, and I'm going to offer to continue to represent the clients at a discount. What about that? So here's my view. First of all, I don't even know that David's a trial attorney. For all I know, he's a transactional lawyer. Who cares if he has any trial experience? <laughs> and I'm assuming he took trial in litigation matters with him. You're right. If not, right. it's going to yeah. So it could be that the managing partner doesn't have a clue. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so let's say David was a litigator, OK? And, and then uh, the managing partner says, listen, instead of X, I'm going to give you a 20% discount. What about that? Managing partner can do that? Sure. Managing as long, partner? As long as the, the other partner, you know, as long as he's not breaching any fiduciary duties to his other partners. Right. So, and, and then it would have to be true that David, right. that, 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 right, that, him. Yeah, that's right, that David doesn't have any trial experience and somehow that's relevant. Right. So that's part of the equation. So has David behaved ethically? So I don't know. What do you think? David wants to download everything from, from the iPhone, he wants to take his personal stuff, wants to take form files. So we've talked about the ethical considerations, and, and David, uh, if he's done all this, absent uh, permission from the law firm, uh, absent permission from the, the, the clients, as we've talked about, uh, he's most likely crossed the line. Uh, 
as the managing partner behaved ethically, if he's told the truth about David's trial experience, uh, he's welcome to call those clients, and if he wants to discount fees, he's more than welcome to do it. There's no law that says he can't do that. So that, that, that's okay, too. He's, he's welcome to do that. So what about client files? Okay. So a terminator with one <coughs> lawyer shall promptly release to the client at the request of the client all the papers. So that, that's important. We know that. But uh, clients need to be aware of that, that the client has the right to have those documents. They, they have the right to be able to say, I want my papers back. Uh, there's a couple formal opinions. So anything that's in the public domain, for example, not a problem. Uh, a lawyer does not violate any model rule taking copies that she herself created for general use in the practice. Uh, I'm concerned about that. I, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate, especially given what I see as the nature of written employment agreements and or shareholder or partnership agreements of, among partners and shareholders and between employers and employees. So uh, I, I have a little doubt about how that would be played. I would say before you relied on that to make sure you check whatever documents you are subject to or whatever else you're subject here. to. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, that's important as well. So now we want to talk about the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and that's something Roger touched on before, which is notwithstanding all of, of the model rules and notwithstanding the rules of professional conduct, notwithstanding the ABA model rules, there's still the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, which is codified in the Civil Code in California. Uh, and, and that is to say there will may be uh, a trade secret that the client has developed, uh, strike that, that the uh, employer, the law firms developed, uh, and that the employee, the associate, has developed in the course and scope of employment, which would include what we often have on our contact form, client contacts. So it's not only that we might have the name and address and contact information, but also we have oftentimes assistants. We have uh, subordinate employees that are there. Uh, we have the type of matters that they're engaged in. Oftentimes we have budget cycles of when the budget comes up again. Uh, if there's budget issues, uh, we might have other information that's what I consider to be not on the internet or uh, in the public domain or not in the public library uh, that has been developed over the course of time. Uh, so that's a, we can have birthdays of key people. We can have the names of their children, for example, or spouse. Oftentimes that's all in client contacts, and, and that's part of the, this whole process of, of developing uh, a trade secrets. Uh, it has economic value. Uh, it's not known to the public, uh, and, and it's not readily disposable. So uh, that would be improper to, uh, to use that. Can I tell you where this is coming up now? Um, and has, has been the subject of some discussion is information on Facebook, Twitter, those kind of things which are not necessarily publicly known. But you have you a friend with somebody on Facebook or you follow them on Twitter or vice versa. All that's way over my head because I don't do any of that stuff, but but I, I, I understand how it works. And that is another issue that's created a whole level of complexity to some of these discussions. Okay, so the trade, Uniform Trade Secrets Act does not forbid an individual from announcing the change of employment, even if they happen to be on the list. But you're not going to get the information from the list. It's going to be through a source that I talked about earlier. And, and if, if I go to uh, an independent uh, uh, advertising or marketing person and, and I do a general solicitation again by SIC code or by zip code, that's fine. That, that's not a problem. But I'm not going to use trade secrets to solicit clients. Uh, and uh, I, it, to the extent possible, if I can coordinate the announcement with the firm, that's the better view. So we want to play nice. Playing nice is always important. Uh, so now, what about a duty to provide services to client after the new firm takes over? So again, the client uh, ethical considerations are we want to make sure that the client's protected. Uh, but once the new law firm take, takes over, then normally if it's litigation, of course, you're going to have a substitution of attorney. The better view is to get something in writing that the client acknowledges that new co is taking over. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our program.
happy to answer questions or comments or uh, nothing attorney-client privilege that we want to talk about individually. <laughs> you can see Roger about that afterwards. But, uh, that's, that's the reason. So, uh, happy to entertain anything anybody has, just comments about it. stuff you want to talk about. I do have a question. Sure. The question I have is, what is the uh, employer's or the remaining partner's obligation to provide you with information concerning your client? So if you notify me I'm leaving and you ask me to please exit to the left um, and I leave with nothing, I don't have any of my client's telephone numbers, email addresses, or anything, what is the flip side obligation with respect to your employer or your managing partner in terms of providing you, notifying you these are your clients, you have a legal obligation to notify your clients, we're washing our hands, go to town, or can they just say, nope, you're gone, this is our stuff, I mean, how do you address okay, that? Good question. Uh, well, somebody has to notify the client that, that there's been a change. It doesn't necessarily have to be the lawyer, the client has to be notified. They could say, you're out of here, we'll notify your clients that you're no longer with the firm and that lawyer X is now going to be handling your that. So they could do that. They can do that, and, and a lot of firms will, again, will do that. I've seen it less in the legal context where I've seen it in other contexts with customers where they'll say, you're out of here, don't don't contact the customers, and they then those companies will then designate someone to start calling those customers and saying, hey, you know, Joe Blow is no longer here, we've now assigned, you know, whoever, Cynthia Smith is now going to handle your account, and she's going to be taking this from this point forward. If you have any questions, please direct them to her. Here's Cynthia's contact information. We're happy to help you. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll pick this up and you won't miss me. So here's what I would do. If you now come to me and, and you give me that story, well, the first thing I'm going to do is call the firm myself and say, listen, I'm going to go over all these, the rules of professional conduct. I'm going to go over the VP code section. And I'm going to say, first and foremost to the clients. So do I understand correctly that you're going to be sending out this announcement to clients and you're going to do it in, in the next day? And, and may I have a, a written confirmation that you're going to do that, and that you're going to have a written confirmation that you're going to notify every client, every client that you've worked on. And then I'm going to follow that up with a letter to confirm, and then I want to see if I don't get something acknowledging that that's been completed in a day, then I'm going to take, I'm going to do something else. I'm not quite sure what, but, but I want written confirmation that, you're, that that firm's going to handle that. Because i got to cover you. i, I got to make sure that your ethical responsibility and then my view of it is, Roger was right when he said earlier, you're now gone. So for those clients that you do have contact information for, you're welcome to call them. And you're welcome to say, by the way, I need you to know I'm not with Big Law anymore. Uh, and, and you might or might not know what you're going to do. You'll tell them the truth, whatever it is. But to the extent you're able to notify them, I want to be able to do that. And, and you may get some of them. You may get all of them. I don't know. But I want to try yeah, I mean, I think one thing to consider when we're talking about all this is that let's assume that at some point in time it comes down to a lawsuit of some sort, and there, there's a claim being made that there's a Uniform Trade Secrets Act violation, there's a, there's a solicitation violation, et cetera. Who's going to have to testify to that? The client that you took or that went with you is going to be the only person who's going to be competent to testify that you solicited him or her. And if they went with you and chose you over the other, the firm, the chances of that firm getting favorable testimony from the client who said, see you guys, I'm going with whoever, is slim and none. So, you know, after, all, after we shake all this out and get to the bottom of it, the practical reality is, is at the end of the day, that these clients want to go with you, they trust you, they're going to end up with you sooner or later. So you know that again, you have to you do have to weigh some of that because it's the client who would most likely be the one who would be complaining. But if the law firm does allege that this was done, they're going to, they're going to have to get a deposition or a declaration from that client. Well, good luck. And frankly, what we've been talking about for the last hour and a half is risk management. That's what we've been talking about. I mean, really, what we don't want to do is hear from the state bar, and, and what we don't want to do is hear from our former law firm that says, "Hey, you've done something wrong." And I don't want to hear from the client that we've done something wrong. So th these are hopefully techniques that will keep all of us in, in, uh, in good stead and, and uh, we can move forward and, and without worrying about those issues. So thank you again. Thank you.